Rock and roll is no stranger to controversy and has had many throughout its history. But in the 90s, no one was more vile, profane, sacrilegious, and provocative than Brian Hugh Warner, aka Marilyn Manson. Early in his career, Manson quickly established himself as one of rock's most shocking personas. His songs attacked religion, discussed violence, and criticized modern-day America, while his live performances drew from the shock rock tendencies of icons such as Arthur Brown and Alice Cooper, and included onstage behavior behavior that many deemed lewd and offensive. His public image made him an easy target for mainstream media who labeled him as a negative influence on the youth and used his works as scapegoats for acts of violence and crime all over the country. How did Marilyn Manson become one of the most notorious figures in rock history? Keep watching as we deep dive into the story of Marilyn Manson's ascent as the Antichrist superstar and his portrayal as a poster boy for everything that conservatives hated about rock and roll. Early Years Marilyn Manson made a career out of pushing the most sensitive buttons that there are in society, and although his infamy is not as high as it was in the 90s to early 2000s, he remains the subject of multiple controversies until today. Brian Hugh Warner was born on the 5th of January 1969. As a young kid, he attended a Christian school where the teachers tried to show other students what types of music to avoid. Rather than follow his superiors, however, Brian went the opposite route and ended up liking the music he was told not to listen to. In 1989, Brian took up journalism at Broward Community College in Florida and gained more experience in the field by becoming a writer for the local magazine 25th Parallel. Around this time, he met and interviewed many musicians who would later influence his music, the most notable of which is Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, who would later become his mentor. In 1989, Brian met guitarist Scott Butch and began a band together. They recruited bassist Brian Tatunek and released a demo that year under the name Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids. The three members adopted pseudonyms that combined the first name of a famous sex symbol and the last names of notorious serial killers. Tatunek became Olivia Newton Bundy, Puteski became Daisy Berkowitz, and Brian became Marilyn Manson by combining the names of Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson. Later, Tatunek was replaced by Brad Stewart, who took on the name Gidget Gein. The band added drummer Fred Str Reithorst, who took on the name Sara Lee Lucas, and keyboardist Steven Beer, who became Madonna Wayne Gacy. Even in their early years, the band used shocking theatrics to distinguish their live performances, including naked women on stage, bloody animal parts, and outlandish costumes. In 1992, the band shortened their name to Marilyn Manson and were discovered by Trent Reznor the following year who signed them to his label, Nothing Records. In 1994, Manson and his band released their debut album, Portrait of an American Family. Musically, the album was a mix of alternative metal and industrial influences. The album wasn't a commercial success, but helped helped court attention from the music press and drew more eyeballs to Manson's brand of shock rock. The band released an EP the following year, Smells Like Children. It featured a brooding cover of the Eurythmics hit Sweet Dreams, and its video received heavy airplay on MTV. It eventually became a fan favorite and is frequently played at live concerts, but it was his next album where he pushed the envelope to unheard of limits. Rise in Popularity and Early Controversies in 1996, Manson released his second album, Antichrist Superstar. From a conceptual standpoint, the album found Manson at perhaps his most nihilistic, with songs that acted as harsh critiques of America's conservative demographic and the religious right. The title alone is enough to turn a lot of heads, especially those from the Christian community who deemed the album offensive and blasphemous. Many of the stops for the album's promotional tour were picketed by religious groups who falsely accused the band of employing satanic rituals and human sacrifice in their performances. The album's notoriety was so huge that it attracted the attention of politicians who cited it as one of many albums that negatively affected America's youth. They even dissected the album's lyrics a year later in a series of congressional hearings held by then-Senator Joseph Lieberman and Sam Brownback of the U.S. House of Representatives. The proceedings were meant to examine the negative influence of Manson's lyrics on children, with Senator Lieberman calling Manson's music vile, hateful, nihilistic, and damaging. Nonetheless, it was a critical and commercial success and debuted at number three on the Billboard 200. Its first single, The Beautiful People, became one of Manson's signature songs and received three nominations at the 1997 MTV Video Music Awards. Manson and the band performed the song live during the ceremony where the singer opened with a speech that attacked religion before launching into a wild performance that many critics noted as a highlight of the night. The publicity generated by the album's controversy also helped elevate Manson's visibility in the mainstream media. 
After the success of Antichrist Superstar, Manson released his third album, Mechanical Animals, in 1998. In contrast to the violent nature of its predecessor, Mechanical Animals patterned itself after the glam rock of David Bowie in terms of sound and image, and many of its songs addressed the dark side of celebrity status. The album was another critical and commercial success and became Manson's first album to debut at number one on the Billboard 200. Despite the change in style and image, conservatives hadn't forgotten the Antichrist Superstar era version of Manson and continued pointing to the singer as a negative influence on society. On April 20th, 1999, America witnessed one of the most tragic events in its history when the Columbine Massacre occurred. Students Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris opened fire throughout Columbine High School, resulting in the deaths of 12 kids and a teacher before they took their own lives. It remains one of the worst school shootings in U.S. history to this day. In analyzing the massacre and what may have caused it, many in the media pointed to the music of Marilyn Manson as a possible catalyst. The public began speculating that the shooters were fans of Manson, although this was later debunked. Manson and his band canceled the last few dates of their North American tour out of respect for the Columbine victims. Still, the finger pointing continued, and Manson finally responded in an article on Rolling Stone, where he criticized the country's gun culture and the media's irresponsibility for their coverage of the events. Manson returned in 2000 with a new album titled Hollywood in the Shadow of the Valley of Death. The record was the singer's rebuttal at the accusations pinned on him following the Columbine shootings and a harsh critique of American celebrity culture and the widespread glorification of violence. While it didn't sell as well as its previous two predecessors, it was highly acclaimed by fans and critics, with many considering it Manson's best album. The following year, Manson was featured in Michael Moore's documentary, Bowling for Columbine, where the filmmaker interviewed the singer regarding the shootings three years prior. Manson took the opportunity to call out American culture, which he says is based on fear and consumption, and questioned why it was easy for the media to blame him for the shootings when President Clinton was dropping bombs overseas on the same day as Columbine. When asked by Moore what Manson would say to the shooters, the singer famously replied, I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say. And that's what no one did. Continued infamy in the 2000s. Manson continued being productive throughout the 2000s. In 2003, he released his next album, The Golden Age of Grotesque, his second album to debut at the top spot of the Billboard 200. The following year, he released his greatest hits compilation, Lest We Forget, The Best Of. Manson initially hinted at retirement with its release, but three years later made a comeback with 2007's Eat Me, Drink Me, a record that alluded to the fallout of his relationship with his ex-wife Dita Von Teis and his blossoming relationship at the time with actress Evan Rachel Wood which became a high-profile affair in showbiz. In 2009, Manson released his seventh album, The High End of Low, which was also his last album with longtime label Interscope. Manson and his band subsequently signed with independent record label Cooking Vinyl. Under this new label, Manson released his next album, 2012's Born Villain, which featured actor Johnny Depp as a guest guitarist on the track You're So Vain. Recent Years and Controversies In 2015, Manson released his ninth studio album, The Pale Emperor. In contrast, to his usually heavy industrial metal sound, Manson adopted a blues approach for the album that drew comparisons to The Doors. Critics praised the album as one of his best and started a creative resurgence in the later stage of his career which continued with 2017's Heaven's Upside Down and 2020's We Are Chaos. But along with this creative resurgence came a new wave of controversies. In 2021, several women accused Manson of sexual and psychological abuse. Adding to the allegations was former fiance Evan Rachel Wood who stated that Manson was a abusive during their time together. Following Wood's statement, four women came forward to sue Manson, who denied the allegations and motioned for the dismissal of the suits. Three of the suits were dismissed, while the fourth one, filed by Game of Thrones actress Esme Bianco, was settled out of court in January 2023. In 2022, Manson sued Wood for defamation, emotional distress, and impersonation of an FBI agent to falsify documents. The case has yet to be resolved. Controversy has followed Marilyn Manson throughout his three-decade career, and it looks like it won't change anytime soon. If anything, the singer thrives in controversy and is unwilling to compromise what he stands for. Love him or hate it, Marilyn Manson's legacy is undeniable, and he'll always be remembered as one of rock's greatest iconoclasts.